there's no winning in business, right? Like mm -hmm. there's no like, here comes the fourth quarter. Like there's no winning, there's no end. Yeah. It's just, are you willing to improve forever? I wanna have like a hundred year practice. That's like a legacy. Dr. Ryan Neinstein is a plastic surgeon, board certified by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. He's had an extremely busy practice here in New York City for the past 10 years, and his unique expertise is in liposuction and body sculpting, about which he's written several textbooks. And he's a feel-confident beauty expert with expertise in liposuction. This podcast is sponsored by Feel Confident. So to optimize your skincare and hair care routine, Teens, make sure to check out feelconfident.com. So I was checking out your website and I read this line that I thought was really interesting. It's impossible to be a master of every type of operation. So surgical mastery is about familiarity and judgment within specialized procedures. So this resonated with me because about a year and a half ago, I pretty much um, reduced the scope of my practice to just hair surgery and lip surgery, cosmetic. I, I love that. <laughs> And I have so many questions about that, but <laughs> yeah. tell me more. So yeah, so so that that's you're doing just hair, just hair surgery, and and, and the full breadth of that, which some people don't realize and, how. And I'm broad sure it is. that like everyone who watches this knows the story, but like give me the the elevator pitch on on your aha moment or your breakthrough moment, because that decision, something like yeah. that, which I respect immensely, does not happen easily. It was not an easy one, and I talked to patients about it. I talked to, you know, family, friends, and it took me about well, that's maybe your first four months. It's your first mistake. <laughs> you don't need advice from other people. Well, that's true. That's true. But it, it was, you know, I was mulling it over for, for months. So like just getting as many opinions. I was actually hoping that people would talk me out of it, but everyone was like super supportive. They're like, yeah, if that's what you want to do, then go for it. But basically, I mean, it's for it was for many reasons. And I, I thought about making a dedicated video about it. I never did. So I'll talk about some of those reasons because there's like, you know, oh, this is just like what I want to do now. But it's, it's more deeper. complicated. It's, it's got to be more beneath more, the surface, right? It's, it's more got to be emotional, yeah, physical, spiritual when you <laughs> change your whole life after going to school for as long as we did. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it was drawing on a lot of the stuff that, you know, like I learned and, and trained in. But um, there are lots of reasons. I mean, first of all, my own hair lost journey. You know, that was a big part of it. I didn't get into hair surgery because I had hair loss. I mean, I had alopecia areata on my lower extremities since medical school, but it never affected like my scalp hair or okay. really any other area. But during COVID and, you know, this is like my homepage YouTube video. So a lot of people know this story, but uh, basically around COVID um, had Bell's palsy that improved and started to lose like all my hair and it was universalis and and then you know it would come and go a little bit but i never really got my hair back uh so so that so how do you keep that, it so spick and span right now uh, <laughs> i don't do much it's okay. actually quite easy to maintain that's easy. Oh, <laughs> yeah I'm you dry jealous. you dry very quickly after showers so that's that's nice save on hair care products and you save yeah well yeah but then again we want people to buy these so. <laughs> exactly well, listen, I I've, already told, I've had two <laughs> hair transplants and yeah. you know I mean, it looks great. And the only one, you know, yeah. the only thing I haven't done is had a hair transplant by a bald guy. So. Okay. All right. Well, when, when it's time for number three. I'm ready. I'm yeah. ready. Yeah. I get a lot of doctors, as I'm sure you I'm do. Sure. And, and other professionals who appreciate the quality and everything that we do. But but yeah, but I mean, th th that was, so just to get back to like the reasons, right? So So there was that emotional side of it. There was the side of like, we were growing, we were accelerating quite fast through, you know, YouTube growth, really, um, that was a, a big push. And SEO, had you know, that was going too. But as we were growing, like, and it was the boom of like, you know, post COVID and all that, the consults were getting scheduled out like six months, and then people would wait three to four months for surgery. For some people, that's exciting. And that's like, oh my God, yeah, great. People are waiting all this time for me. And we have, I think, a mutual friend, Miguel Mascara, who's booked out for a long, long time. And so uh, I actually think, or the, there's good data from Harvard Business Review. People want to have plastic surgery. 90% of people want to have surgery within three weeks of their consultation. Yeah. It's not something they want to mull over. The, yeah. All the mulling was as, was as pre. Once right. they get here yeah. and they've had the courage to show, show their head, to me, show their body, they're ready yeah. to go. Yeah. The longer you wait, time cools all deals. They're gonna, yeah. someone's gonna convince them not to do it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So your model, you either keep raising your prices, mm -hmm. but that has like, some trickery or just like, you know, there's only so far you can go. 
True. if you want to maintain that supply demand curve. Or like for me, we just keep adding like-minded surgeons so we can add more volume mm -hmm. versus having to always just increase prices. Right, right. No, for sure. And so honestly, I didn't really know what to do. And I, I probably should have reached out to someone like you at that time. But I was just like, wait, I don't want to be scheduled out so, so far. I also wanted to do more hair surgery. And I was like, oh, all these people, especially on it's YouTube. It's truly authentic. Like I wanted to be doing more of it. But now, you know, people were coming for facelifts and rhinoplasty. And it was all these things that I was like very grateful for. But on the other hand, I was like, wait a second, like, let me project out 10 years, 15 years. Like, I want to be a true, like, international expert in something. And I can't do it for all of those things. And any procedure that I did, I felt like I was doing on a high level, I had good training. But like to be doing it like as like one of the best like in the world or on that level, you have to do it all the you know, time. When I'm hiring surgeons or staff or any of that matter, and I hyper specialize too, I only do like two procedures. I talk about the difference between good and great is so vast if you can't, like if you can't even comprehend it. Like, what mm -hmm. does that mean? I said, well, let's just say every surgeon takes 20 years of training and basic training and blah, blah, and medical school right. to get to seven out of 10. To go from seven to eight out of 10 is the equivalent of work of another 20 years. To go mm -hmm. from eight to nine is the equivalent of work of another 20 years. And yeah. if you actually want to go from like that nine to 10, you have to probably ruin a significant part of your life and yeah. then do a thousand times more work than the second best guy ever. Right. And it's the boring work mm -hmm. it is. And the time frame for this is decades. It's not years. Right. And the evolution is so small that you can't even see it in real time. Right, those small iterations that you do from small procedure to procedure from over before, one year. during, and after. Yeah. It's so slow, monotonous, that most people can't comprehend it. And that's why most surgeons, mm -hmm. most people, most services, most products, most just suck because yeah. they want to regress to the mean. Most so, people are okay with mediocre. Yeah, mediocre is seductive because yeah. there's a big pool of people. Those are all the people online that are tapping each other on the back and hating on everyone else. Yeah. Because, you know, everyone's your friend on your way up because you remind mm -hmm. them of their dreams. Mm -hmm. But when you get to the top of the mountain, yeah. everyone hates you. Right. Because you remind them of the dreams they gave up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's well said. So that's when they try to tear you down. They try to bring you back mm -hmm. down the mountain to that right. mediocrity in the mean. Yeah, regression so gotta, to the mean. <laughs> yeah, and that was one of the things I wanted to ask you because going out on your own, mm -hmm. especially when I see this from the outside, it's this like paradox of paradox. You're like, I'm gonna dedicate myself to hair surgery, but I have no hair. So it's like this right. interesting paradox. But I, it for is. me, as someone it who is. is a you know avid reader, I like the abyss of like randomness i'm like that is intriguing to me i want to learn more about that yeah but it's like that's probably the question you get at every consult or maybe they are they too scared to ask or it. they kind of know the story because i'm open about it you know so they, they watch but the it, videos it, but that and... paradox is an unbelievable story yeah and the thing is it, again it wasn't that i went into hair with no hair you know it's just that i decided part of the reason to focus on it was because of the hair loss. So that's the nuance there, you know, because some people think like, oh, yeah. And other, I mean, I think most people who don't know the actual story assume that I have, you know, androgenic alopecia and I just choose to shave my head. Yeah. What I like about this nuance is that I can educate people on the different types of hair loss and that not all of them are treated with a like transplant. Do you feel like there's a true kinship? Like you capture the heart and mind, like when you're talking to a patient in your consult, mm -hmm. do you feel like you got, you're like talking, like the Venn diagram of like fears, feelings, and emotions are just like overlapping and it's easy to connect? Oh yeah, it's definitely easier to connect. But on the flip side of that, like I remember when I was training under um, Jeff Epstein out of Miami, he was, you know, I was like his New York City arm for hair for, for a few years. As I was growing my own practice, I was also working under him for all things hair before I took it under um, my practice uh, like four years ago. And during that time, we'd see consult together and I had like a really full head of hair you know we'll, we'll put it up in the, in the video yeah but uh but it was like a norwood zero you know up until age 34. Um, i gotta get my hair out you know i just had was in surgery for 10 hours but like i feel like i'm on the i mean this is the right place for me to show off the locks here yeah 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 you, could, you can keep that off yeah. i actually wear my scrub cap quite a bit um but i figured for these podcasts it's okay uh, i can have surgery head, surgery hair we're good to go it's all good so when i was with them and i would do consults with them people many patients would point to me and be like, 
I want that guy's hair. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think there's something to be said. And most hair transplant surgeons have had a hair transplant, either that or they're bald. It's like okay. one or the other. It's extremes. So yeah, they would look at me like that. And it's so like every that, LASIK eye surgeon I ever met wears glasses. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we don't always practice what we preach. But uh, I was definitely very worried uh, when I lost all the hair. Like, would people even show up? Would they come to me? And I think part of that, so part of the whole YouTube growth was like catharsis for me to like put these videos out yeah. there to feel better about my condition. I guess I felt better just talking about it and be like, this is it. This is what I have. You know, don't you don't have to be guessing at anything. I'm going to tell you exactly what it is. So that was part of it. But it was also scary. Fear is a tough feeling to fake. So yeah. and I think people appreciate that authenticity. If they're watching a video and they can sense that you're, you know, actually timid, or you know, fearful of how this may respond, yeah. that's gonna grip people because it doesn't seem like some scripted BS razzle dazzle. Um, that's the yeah. real deal. So that's gonna attract probably more authentic, sophisticated consumers um, versus someone who, you know, if you have like a Jack and the Magic Bean, you know, yeah. something gimmicky. And people aren't used to seeing doctors be vulnerable. No. You know, uh, we're sort of supposed to be these elevated creatures of just, you know, immense, you know, uh, skill and all of that, but we're humans and, and we have our own problems and, you know, we have, we, we have our own fears. And so I never had a problem with just being an open book. And so this is just like one, I guess, manifestation of that. One of the things that I am most proud of in my career is patients when they come see me from all over the world, near or far, whether it's Staten Island or Singapore Island, they always say, you're exactly how you are on social media. Mm. And I'm so glad because I feel like I already knew you. People ask me, why do I show so much personal kind of feelings and emotions? And I say, listen, I know who I am. I also know who I like to operate on in the sense that I like, you know, I'm a family oriented person. I basically only work with moms, mommy makeovers. So young families, people who are fitness, into fitness, they're into travel, they're into fun, mm -hmm. they, they're funny, they like to take care of themselves and they want the best out of, you know, out of the, their life. Those people, it doesn't matter where they're from in the world, they're like the same avatar. Yeah. So it's interesting because I have patients from Sydney, Australia and someone from Greenwich, Connecticut. And while their accents are different, they're like literally <laughs> the same person. Yeah. And it's very easy for me to connect to someone when I feel like, I understand their fears, mm -hmm. their feelings, and like I capture their hearts and minds. And it's like, I, even though I met someone for the first time, I connect instantly because I really, really believe that medicine should not be transactional and that it's relationship based. We're mm -hmm. looking to be with people forever, not just, you know, an operation. And see you later. You know, I, it's like, to me, it's marriage. Yeah. It's not a one night stand. Um, so that's where I found social media has been great in that engagement is not just like, hey, look at my amazing mm -hmm. before and afters, my amazing team and facilities. It's like, look at my personality. Right. Like, do you want to, you know, be with this community? It's just been a great way to, mm -hmm. you know, prospect and intelligence gather on the patients who come in. I don't feel like, you know, 10 years ago when I started, it was very difficult to connect with people because they would come in from kind of, mm -hmm all walks of life right and like we, we there's be so many personality mismatches well right i mean i think in the beginning also it was maybe like earlier in the practice in your practice and same thing with my you're just looking for numbers it's almost like a, like research right you need yeah. that quantity of uh, publications and then you start looking for the the quality so i think it's something like that in the beginning you're just happy that someone's willing to come to you for a procedure or for a consultation and later on, you realize like it's not all the same. A patient is not a patient is not always you know the same type of patient. It's like you're looking for the right patient, the right fit for you, and you're hoping that they're finding it on their end. And I think a lot of people don't realize the consultation process. If you're a really if you're a good doctor, you're not in there to sell. You're in there to serve, mm -hmm. in the sense that you are there to help them make the best medical decision for them at that juncture in their life. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's surgery. Sometimes that's not surgery. And sometimes maybe that's surgery with someone else. You know, mm -hmm. people are surprised when I'll refer them to someone else who does something similar to me because I think there'll be a better fit. Yeah. Um, but I always feel good about myself at the end of a consultation knowing that I was there to help them make the best medical decision possible. Right. Yeah. It's kind of interesting during consultation, like, you know, because we're, look, we're, 
and we're going to get into this. We're entrepreneurs, we're business people. But when I'm doing consultations, like I'm not honestly thinking about the finances at all. Never. I'm just like, what would make the most sense for this person? Or I try to put myself in their shoes, you know? And and sometimes there isn't a hundred percent agreement. How many consults do you think you've done? Oh, I don't know. I haven't. Guess. I haven't done. Just off the top of your head, because I, I know I'm how many sure. I've done. I, I don't know thousands. I I don't I don't know. So you know, I have, I have three other surgeons that. who work for yeah. me, right? So we have a big onboarding practice, and one of the things that shocks them when they come on board is how much we value the consultation process mm -hmm. and we do mock consults mm -hmm. with the staff who've been there for a long time with certain personality types to see their cadence mm -hmm. to see their tonality we have to have structure because we have mm -hmm. to be able to measure analyze and improve and if there is no structure you mm -hmm. cannot do any of that right? right and we do our mock consults and we tape them mm -hmm. and just like a sports team like if you want to get better at something mm -hmm. tape it roll it back right. analyze it tape it, roll it back, have 10 other people analyze it. Yeah. Wait till someone rips apart your consults. Trust me, after a few weeks, you'll start getting a lot better. So we try to take that like, you know, I did 8,000 free consults before I ever did a paid consult. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most of the surgeons now when they start, they want to just start with paid consults. And I'd be like, don't you want like 8,000 free lessons? Right, right. When we're doing these structures yeah. and we're doing these mocks and we're doing this feedback, that's seven years of 8,000 free consults. That's what they're getting the benefit of. Yeah. You know, if you're 10 years behind me and you have 10 years of my knowledge, when you get to my, like 10 years from now, you shouldn't be at me. You should be 100 years ahead of me. Mm -hmm. Like, I, you know, I'm always like, I'm bringing you guys to train you to like shame on the, you know, master whose pupil doesn't outshine him. That's what Da Vinci always said. Like, if you're not training people yeah. better than you, what is the point? Well, I guess, how would you define a good consultation? Like, what is the goal? What's the what's the ultimate goal of the consultation? To help for, the patient make the best yeah, I agree decision with you. possible. And that's right. And but that you see, that's hard that's much harder to measure it's than not conversion friends. to surgery. Well, no, no, I'm not friends, but like conversion to surgery. Because so, some would argue you just have to convert to surgery. Them. And I don't think about that. So the, the interesting stuff, if you want to look from the the business side, is not the consultation to conversion. Mm -hmm. If anything, I think that should number should be incredibly low. Mm -hmm. Even but the business stuff is getting leads, right? Intelligence gathering on those leads and prospecting. So intel, you know, getting leads. How do you so I want, you know, you can go cold or hot, right? You can go ask the people you already know, whether it's the people in your cell phone, the people in your email list, yeah. or your patient list, hey, do you know anyone who wants plastic surgery? Sure. Um, or cold, right? So you yell out on YouTube, you yell out on Instagram, you can do whatever you want. Um, but how do you get the right leads, right? So mm -hmm. for us, it's like, we know who our avatar is, you know? Most of our women who we operate on are like 35 to 45 who has three kids, you know, this is their mm -hmm. where they like to travel, this is what they like to do, yeah. or they're like 55 to 60. So like, we know how to like speak yeah. to them. And then when they, when they enter, um, you want to do your intelligence gathering. So someone speaks to each person before they have a consult now for about half an hour mm -hmm. before they actually meet the doctor. And that's not in the sense of like, hey, what's your budget? It is like, do you have the agency, authority, the need and the timing? Meaning like, can you actually, do you actually want to do this? Do yeah. you actually need to do this? Do you want to do it like in a reasonable time frame? Do you have the agency to make decisions? And agency to me is not just like, you're the one who could write the check, but it's like, are you able to, you know, have a big plastic surgery procedure and mm -hmm. tolerate the crap you're going to get from your friends. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. is it, yeah. or is that, are you going to call me a week before your operation? And because Sally at soccer practice says you don't need a tummy tuck. Right. Of course. You know, yeah. so yeah. like, you know, agency to me is like, are you a strong willed person? Yeah. Because those are the people we want to work with. Right. Right. So is that, is that a free evaluation for the yeah. prospective yeah. patient? And, and like the consultants, each surgeon has a consultant. Mm -hmm. So the consultants will speak them. And then sometimes they'll figure out like, Hey, you know what? Um, you know, Dr. Anna's a breast specialist. Why don't you see Dr. Anna? Or, mm -hmm. you know, Dr. Pierre's got a little more finesse with this like HD lipo you're into. Why don't mm -hmm. we see him? So like we're, we're using that to best use their time too. Right. right so right. when they get into the surgeon schedule, um, they're really optimized. They're in the right lane for the right time period. No, that makes sense. But that's heavy duty. Like, yeah. you know, that means five people answering phones and emails, four full-time consultants who have assistants. So now you're looking just to get someone onto your schedule is mm -hmm. like 12 full-time employees. Right. And then, so. And that's what? all 
coordinated, yeah, measured, analyzed, and improved. So, who, every so month. who's doing that? Who's doing the analysis? Well, you met Mitch, chief of operations. Oh, so okay. we mm-hmm. make metrics that anyone can accumulate mm-hmm. and anyone can put into an Excel sheet and anyone can analyze. And it's just common sense. Like, okay, this isn't working. Okay, this is working. Let's do more of that. Let's do less of this. And that's mm-hmm. going to change over time, seasonality, and like just with patterns of social, you know, in the social network. So I'm probably scaring like every other doctor in the world. But like, this is the game to me that is like so much fun. It's like, there, it, it's an infinite game. Simon uh, Sinek, I think has a book called The Infinite, like there's no winning in business, right? Like mm-hmm. there's no like, here comes the fourth quarter. Like there's no winning, there's no end. Yeah. It's just, are you willing to improve forever? I want to have like a hundred year practice. Yeah. That's like a legacy. Right. Me. Do you want to continue to grow like the number of doctors that you have working with you? I, I talk about more about maturity versus growth. You know, mm-hmm. I want to keep improving the value to our patients and keep improving mm-hmm. the value to our staff as a employer. So I don't know if that always means adding more, but we right. can do better. Yeah. I mean, people have asked me, like, including my SEO team, because they see the flow and they're like, so are you going to hire someone, especially now that I don't do like the rhinos, the facelifts, you know, we, we get calls about that all the time. And maybe it's bad for business that we're not bringing those people in. Um, and if I had, you know, facial plastic surgeon who wanted to do those procedures, OK, great, we can set them up. To me, I do view it as a bit of well, it's a headache I and mean, everything, everything that we do, right? No matter how you invest your time, in some ways, it's, it's, it's a headache. It's more work. So hiring someone, there's expenses associated with that, like you mentioned. There's so staff you say you need headache to get. Yeah. and I say joyful game, right? So <laughs> yeah. it's just the way you look at it. Right. I also embrace the suck. My mentor uses that word, you know, leaders yeah. and entrepreneurs have to love the suck, like, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be fun. It's not going to be pretty. Yeah. But you have to love that. I love the idea of growth, right? But I think something that I've but realized. You have to love the idea of pain. Well, oh, pain, <laughs> pain all the time. Yeah. I mean, you know, but, but growth. Because growth is messy. But bro- change growth, is messy. Growth yeah. can come in different ways. Yeah. I mean, I think traditionally, you know, I, I've talked to like, just recently I saw like a, my mom's birthday party, like one of her, you know, friends, like he's like, whatever, 70 years old. He's an old ophthalmologist. He has like four offices. And he was like, so how many offices do you have? Uh, I'm like one. He's like, oh, you still only have one office. And he doesn't understand, I mean, you know, just like you, I'm drawing from around the world. And my growth, I've realized is, By the way, is you're digital. Talk, you're talking to the wrong people. Cause like, that guy is, is not, you know, yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. But, and I, it's hard for me to explain that to him, but like, I'm growing. I don't this, think you have to explain to him. Yeah, and it doesn't matter. No, yeah. exactly. I, I gave up before I, you know, even started. But, you know, my growth is. Like, would you rather, and I don't know anything yeah. about him. I'd rather have one office that is known for being an amazing place to work, an right. amazing place to get surgery, than a hundred crappy offices. Oh, for sure. And I do think about expanding you know, the the clinical brand, right? So we have this like new brand for for products. That's yeah. the skincare, hair care. And that was a lot of effort, a lot of pain to get that even off the ground. And now that's starting to to move. We've got all this decide YouTube to do and all that. We have an audience. Is this what it is here? Yeah, that's, that's just, yeah, of course. That's the moisturizer. We have a scar gel that's been out for over a year. Well, I should put this moisturizer on. I just got try back from uh, St. Bart's <laughs> yeah. and my Let's face try it is out all right red. Now. Try, yeah, squeeze it out. Okay. But we, we have, um, we, so we made our own, hair like thickening shampoo conditioner foam so that's coming and then yeah but what people don't realize i think on youtube is that the first person to try your skincare on live on a lot of, yeah well okay. on the podcast All yes, right, I like yes. It. Yeah. what do you think smooth <laughs> silky yeah and it has a nice smell to it because uh, i'm usually like the guy mm-hmm. even though a plastic surgeon yeah like, People like, what do you do for, you know, skincare? I'm like, yeah. whatever my wife leaves out. You know, That's right. Wash my face I, with a shampoo like a normal man. We, we wanted it to be gender <laughs> neutral. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because guys, it's okay to use skincare, you know, products. Women have hair loss and yet it's not talked about. So that, so that was... The shea of butter, I can smell it. I mean, it's... Yeah. Whew, we have yeah, a really good. awesome formulator, um, a, a chemist who has like over 40 years of experience in, in beauty products. He's my mother-in-law's first cousin and he's been in the game for a long long time so i think a lot of people don't realize that like they're like oh like how's this he's a surgeon how does he know like 
together we've figured stuff out i mean and he knows how to make a really good base so this isn't like white labeled garbage you yeah. know um this is from scratch you know we have our clinical team trying all the stuff out it's it's third party tested um new jersey has like a consumer product testing where they do you know patch testing all of that so i mean i wanted like a physical product other than like just like t-shirts and hats that you know or Wait, people we could... like the swag i, I it's uh, not merch okay it's only it, given out you're and, a sp- you're a special i am a very i am a sucker for swag i couldn't you design know. something that if cool someone, so. i got this from the truck from the farming industry okay when, oh wow like john deere could not sell these things yeah. until they came out with john deere hats uh-huh. and then every farmer wanted a hat okay yeah. it's like they want the hat they're willing to buy a, a tractor for it yeah well the sweatshirt you got I'm a, me i'll be I'm wearing a sucker every day. for swag um <laughs> yeah. and we did it it's actually become this kind of like cult like thing for us which has been really fun you see how it says nps yeah and it's got a little heart. We got a heart on our sleeve here. Yeah. So it doesn't say plastic surgery. It doesn't say my name. Mm-hmm. And I see patient and patients. We've given out a, over a thousand. Cool. And patients, you know, send me pictures like, oh, I'm in, uh, you know, St. Bart's or Aspen or Miami or Palm Beach. Yeah. And, and I saw another survivor. You oh, know? okay. And there's okay. like this like. And they give each other like the wink and the nod when they yeah. go by each other. Like right. I, it's I subtle. Know, it's, it's subtle. subtle. Yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. just been something that's fun. And um, yeah, it's it nice. was amazing that I have no clue. But like, you know, I'll see them all over the place. Yeah. And then people when they're in the office, they're just like, can I get some swag? Yeah, like, of course. Yeah. No, it we'll makes be sense. part of a little community. No, Tri- it's, our it's, tribe. It's really cool. No, I mean, listen, doing any of these things, it's just it's a lot of effort. Uh, but it, it's great. And it, exactly. I think it, it's good for the community to have something physical that they can touch. It's not just like words spoken. And many people probably maybe if they, even if they want surgery with you, maybe can't afford it or maybe are too live too far away or whatever the reason. But they can have something of yours. And so there's some element of that, too. I want to ask you, um, how did your colleagues in your societies feel when you started to get hyper focused, so now you're changing. You're no longer like Joe ENT, who's like Joe right. Facial Plastics, Joe whose ENT, yeah. website looks like everyone else, and yeah. is like a specialist in you know whatever face, eyes, nose, all the above. How did that come into play? Because like I usually think they come with the pitchforks. Like I'm a pretty nice guy, and I'm I'm I th- I think I'm kind of social in the sense that like I'll go out and have a good time with someone, but. I'm kind of just like a family guy and yeah. I work all the time. And and I remember you were on, a, what is it called? Blonde Files podcast. You're just like, how much are you willing to give up, right? To be an yeah. entrepreneur. And for me, that's also a lot, you know? And I love just the excitement of like doing new things so and like growing. Did you feel any feedback from your colleagues so, online? So coming back to that, the thing is, I'm not like always going out with all these guys that are like my colleagues you know like Did i'm you friendly with patients, them like someone was saying this so oh, he thinks he's a breast a hair expert now and all this kind of stuff uh, no it's more um in forums like some reddit forums for example where oh, that's a honey some random people right are like reddit trying to take just, me down yeah. because like who is this guy growing how can he be good who do you train with i don't know so instead of actually way, doing the that's research how you know you're doing it right yeah that's like literally like okay you like, get the haters. That means you're doing something right. Well, nobody <laughs> punches down, right? They only right. punch up. Yeah. So, yeah. congratulations. But not from colleagues. I yeah. mean, the only <laughs> thing was that, like, there, there was this one. It was definitely, like, an audit inspired, I'm sure, by a colleague from, like, the ISHRS, which is, like, a hair organization, where they're, like, he's not a full fellow yet. And with this one wording on his website gives the impression Look that maybe he is. It's amazing what you remember. And I'm like, it's very clear you that it's an associate member. You get invited to give the lectures member. at the meetings or is it the same people who've been doing it for forever who have these small practices, all blah, you know? I just go to the Global Aesthetic Conference every year and, and they let me speak there and that's cool. And then- um, Are you speaking the, on social media? Are you speaking on- Technical stuff. Technical stuff, yeah. So the lip and the hair stuff that I do. And, and I did give one talk about YouTube. Um, that was not this past year, but the year before. Uh, and people seem to like it, except for all the marketing guys in the room who were just like trying to sell their yeah. company's products. And here I am saying, you don't need any of that How stuff. How obsessed are you about thumbnails, colors, words? Oh, all of it matters. Yeah. All of it. I, I have a YouTube manager. He's really great. Um, these guys are awesome. You know, it's it's it takes a community. Like thumbnail a is like a whole world. Oh, it is thumbnail, the title, 
uh, colors, the colors on ev everything, on mobile, the colors on desktop. Do but you get that it's into the, the editing? It's it's yeah. all these little things. But once you start to realize, okay, this format is working, you just kind of replicate it, and and that tends to be fine. Some exciting videos that I make that I think are exciting that are a little bit like off the beaten path. They usually underperform. And I'm like, eh, the, okay, fine. One I'll thing still do nobody it. knows, and I don't care who you are in marketing, nobody no. really knows how any content is going to hit. Right. Because all of us are like, here comes a banger. Yeah. I am going to light up the internet. And it's like your mother yeah. and like, you know, someone from high school who both write negative comments. Or, yeah. and then you throw something up haphazard and this is true. It, it somehow it hits right I'll, through the heart. And I'll tell you one off. thing that's really consistent. The celebrity analyses. Yeah. I and don't it, do it. I, I, I do it. And, and I, I used, get it. I used I to not like, it. I used to not like doing it. I used to do it reluctantly. I used to do it just because we're like, okay, this worked. I guess I'll do another one. Um, and now I kind of like it more. It's the weirdest thing, partly maybe because I know it's going to perform and that's helpful. It's almost like a, I don't know, like a rocket ship. I feel like I could put other Listen, things. I, I could take the products. Any game. Put on. I, it's just not authentic to me. Yeah. And, and it never really felt super authentic to me. I, I really see it as like an educational tool. Um, and I've come to terms with that and I've started to actually enjoy it more just from like a standpoint of just like an intellectual thing of like you're analyzing faces and seeing how they change over time and speculating, though it, it takes a lot for me to say, like, I think I see some signs of potentially this procedure, whereas people who are not doctors or, or other doctors, they're just like throwing out stuff, yeah. you know, like, oh, facelift this. Face like for me, like I'm looking through lots and lots of I might put up one photo from a year. But if I'm not sure or if I'm going to call something, I'll look at 50 pictures from that year, you know, just to kind of have a good sense. But then I use it to explain to people. And the most interesting thing I find is that my analyses are like judgment free, like, I mean, they're speculative, but like as objective as you can be, like not placing any like, oh, this was a bad idea. This was a good idea. Oh, and they should get this. It's nothing like that. But the comments are like so vastly different. You know, so some people are like, oh, I can't believe, you know, like you, you, you called her out for this. And it's like, there was no calling anyone out for anything. It's just like, there are changes. Some of them might be aging related. So you read some, the comments. Some might not be. Sometimes. I mean, there's too many to read daily, you know, but can you imagine I mean, a world where you don't read any comments? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it, sometimes comments like, do you either think it would change your anything like do you, would you change the content? Do you think you the I've narrative of your content changes based on the type of content, the comments? It, I've made some adjustments to videos uh, like thumbnails that people thought if, if 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 we put a thumbnail together that some people thought and it was like consistent in the comments it was like distasteful for some reason Got like it. like it was like some ethnic thing that people didn't like or like if we can do better and maybe when we put it up we didn't realize it could have that connotation like we'll make some adjustments so i think it's it's helpful to a degree but i mean they're all over the like about my voice one comment will be like this guy's voice it's like asmr i fall asleep to you to your videos next comment you need some like lubricating for those vocal cords it's like you can't you can't please the world and i and actually it's really helpful to not care about what people say in general in real life you know not just on the internet because you you read every possible thing there is to know Has about anyone you. who's ever said a negative comment to you online ever come up to you in person no no it's, it's so it's, it's never it's not real not only that but if you look at the have people, you ever had anyone come up to you say anything negative in person no and yeah, I, I went amazing? to lunch today and the lady who was there cleaning was like i know you from youtube yeah and she was so nice and maybe she wrote the nastiest thing in the world on you and she it's was possible. the nicest person yeah no one's so like those internet negative. muscles are all you know juiced up and, and the usernames are never real. The people who write the real negative stuff, it's never like a real name. That's the other interesting. It's always like user nine two six seven. You know. I feel like I have alligator skin at this point. Like it, it gets pretty thick. So, but what, I and guess, I just think back to you know Teddy Roosevelt's demand in the arena. Yeah. Like nobody, you know, unless you're in there. If it, listen, if a colleague who I truly respect, you've had a lot on this, or you know, calls me and tells me something, I'm gonna listen because right. guess what? That's growth. That's learning, right? right. If someone's gonna teach me something. You know, learning is really um, same environment, new behavior, right? Yeah. So if I'm doing something stupid and I'm, you know, no matter in that same situation comes up or environment right. and my behavior doesn't change, you know, 
I'm just an idiot. So if someone's going to help me improve that, but none of these comments, sayings or things get, or, or have any learning quotient yeah. or inertia to it, right? But here's another category. So <laughs> we talked about the online trolls, whatever, or just people, you know, keyboard but, warriors. By the way, I've never had, I've had, you know, obviously we get it too. Just, it's just the nature of the beast. Yeah. Every time in public, someone comes up to me that I don't know, it is like the nicest, absolute kindest thing yeah. in the world. Similar yeah. to you when I'm out, I'm probably out with my kids. Like yeah. I've still yet to see the person who yeah. like comes up yelling and screaming no, at me and my God. children. Yeah, like, thank you know, God that no, happened. but it's yeah. like, you know, if you yeah. if the vitriol online, you'd think that these people would be up there with they're pitchforks, everywhere. Yeah, exactly. you know, trying to kill you yeah. and your family. But really they meet you in person and they're like, just super yeah, nice. For sure. So because who yeah. knows what's happening in their life at that time? They're like, you know, I don't, yeah, that's I don't true. even no, care. It's usually <laughs> very much a reflection of the negativity in their life, much more than something that we say that's actually bad so anger hate mediocrity yeah. are all seductive right you don't really get a lot of momentum from saying something nice but like yeah. if i make a witty comment to make fun of you that'll get 37 likes and like yeah. start a thread so going back to the comment about alligator skin uh one of my friends who i'm sure you know in town uh richard reich yeah uh, one of his mentors told him uh you need to have skin like a rhino you know to to do the work that we do uh, so I wanted to get back to that. And also, so there's comments from, you know, whatever online people, there's comments from uh, colleagues, potentially, you know, good or bad or whatever. And that I think is useful. But what about comments from from patients, reviews from patients, the negative ones? How do you react to that? Because for me, that's where it, it really hurts. You well, know? listen, Bill Gates said your best source of learning is from your worst, your your most, your customers that hate you the most. Yeah. Okay. So, right. but how do you deal with that? So you pull I, up I can't your big boy pants. Skin, so, yeah. Okay. And you stop and you realize ego is your enemy. At you know, even if if you're Jesus or an ice cream seller, someone's gonna hate you. Okay. Mother right. Teresa would get negative comments today. Right. All right. So grow up. Call these people. I get a negative review or one of my staff member gets a negative review and it's like a real person, not just like right, right, right. whatever. Yeah, yeah. I call, hey, th and I literally say, thank you for taking the time to share this. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear your story. Um, I'm so embarrassed that this happened. Tell me the story from start to finish. Take as much time as you want. And like, tell me what you think I should do to grow and get better so this doesn't happen to you or anyone else again. And like, that's but the deal. Do you feel like that's admitting fault? What Who cares? If By the way, you probably are at fault for something. It may not be, it's it's not likely malpractice, but it's right. like poor customer service. You didn't give them enough time. You didn't respond quick enough. You didn't listen to them. You really didn't, you might've heard them, but you didn't listen to them. Most people mm -hmm. don't feel heard. Um, maybe you're too mercenary with your um, revision enhancement refund policies you know if you have this hey we don't yeah. give any money back we don't do revisions you pay for everything mm -hmm. i don't think that's right i mean mm -hmm. you need to think about it for me it's like if you go to like a fancy hotel let's say you're going to the ritz in paris mm -hmm. okay i guarantee you they have like a seven percent like off the top line refund for no reason except for like pay pr pay for peace yeah yeah. So like Mrs. Whatever in room 17 doesn't like the sunlight that day. Yeah. You know, not much you can do about the sun. Yeah. And if she chose to leave her blinds open, you know, but if she, you know, yells and screams enough, they may give her a free night's stay. Right. Because they don't want just like a never ending battle with her. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There is a price for peace. And by the way, admitting fault is like it's not defeat like success no, no, is never sure. final and failure is not fatal that's a churchillian good one like it's okay to make mistakes and by the way and if you're like the like the perfect businessman will t will make more mistakes than the imperfect because the perfect businessman is making mistakes and he's gonna either you know win or learn right i get this call yeah. by the way from docs and surgeons two three times a week Hey, yeah. I have this difficult patient, no idea what to do. I'm like, yeah, you do. You know exactly what to do. <laughs> right, right, right. You just don't want to do it because your ego is in your way. Yeah. Yeah. Do, no, the, the, the problem. Does it look I good? No. Can you fix it? No. Well, Give her money back. 
<laughs> yeah, no, that's true. But <laughs> can the, you fix it? Yeah, the, fix it. Don't charge her. Yeah, the problem is when like you've given someone exactly what they want or what they said they wanted, and then they're unhappy with it, and you're like, this is objectively a good result. Like, you know, I think I, I'm pretty good at taking myself out of it and being like, okay, is this a nice result? But that's what's hard when they're, you know, they're just not satisfied. And sometimes they'll take so the that's money a personality. and sometimes they won't take the money yeah, back, listen. even if you offer it. No. Yeah. You're not going to make everyone happy, but right. you can try. See, that, that's and you what's can... hard for me. I know I can't make everyone it. online happy and I'm okay with that. But when someone comes to my practice, like, I feel like they're, probably, everyone's they're not like gonna family. Think you're like, like, the, yeah. You know, I know what I mean? I do like, feel that way. There's I'm people like, in my family I hate too. So like, Well, that's true. That's true. <laughs> and I don't I don't love everyone like that I, no, I, I operate on. I don't feel like super connected to each but person. You can, you but can, I'm like, this is like my patient. You like, can de-escalate that from vitriol. Like, you can take that away from animosity. You, you can accept that. Yeah. Like, this isn't great. Like, I don't think I can do better. And I hear you that you like difference between empathy and sympathy okay you can empathize at, like and we talked about this in the office you can empathize with a patient who doesn't yeah. like the results meaning you understand that they don't like the results you're not calling them crazy that's okay you don't like them, but don't sympathize right. sympathize meaning right. you would feel the same way as them yeah yeah, yeah. like yeah I'm so i'll first, be clear yeah i like your result yeah i understand you're the customer you don't I don't think I can improve this surgically right. safely. Meaning like, could we go the OR and do a sham? Yes, we're not gonna do that <laughs> right. because that's not moral or ethical. I don't think I can do any better. What do you think I can do to like, you know, leave you with some sense of self that brought you here in the first place? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, they might tell you to go, you know, F off yeah. and like <laughs> you ruin their life. Right. And I think every surgeon and whether or not you did or not, you know, you're just gonna have to live with that one day. Right, right. No, for sure. For sure. But that that's that's something that you can never really fully prepare yourself for, I feel like, in training or whatever, because, you know, you're not the person that that's happening to. And I feel like anyone in like no. a primarily aesthetic, aesthetic, uh, you know, so you need mentor, realm. you need support system. Yeah. Like you have to know you're not alone. So what I like in my big office, you know, with lots of staff is I have a lot of people who've been there, done that with me. Right. right. So if someone's like going to do that to me, I know I'm not alone. I know I have my coordinator, Bella, I have my nurse practitioners who've been with me for like, you know, a, these are a decade. They've seen yeah. all 10,000 patients together. We're in it together. I also have a trusted team of advisors from my mentor to lawyer, you know, people you call. Yeah, 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 for sure. There's never, it's never over. There's always mm -hmm. another move. Right. There's always another chess play. Like you're never out. You're never out of the fight unless yeah. you pull yourself out of it. Yeah. So I know that I will out last whoever's coming at me one of the things that we talked about <laughs> and eventually they will give up yeah because i'm not going anywhere right <laughs> and we talked about this earlier with like um you know deciding to focus in and, and just you know do certain procedures you thought you would limit that but it actually thought, amplifies it no no it didn't no. amplify it i i feel like you know i, I kind of selected out procedures where i could not guarantee but but come close to 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 creating very high satisfaction rates you know so so Listen, now it is, i like your perfectionism i am the same yeah. you do not tolerate mediocrity by right. the way people who get who tolerate mediocrity don't have a lot of complaints because they don't have a lot of business and they don't have a lot of happy people either seven out of tens just kind of cruise by yeah um yeah that's the thing my, my patients are generally so happy that even the slightest bit of negativity. Yeah, there's nothing you could have done. It just gets like, it's just so loud in my head because I'm like, wait a second, the last 50 so people were so happy. So if you ask someone in any and industry. This person, and it's never like, it, the problem that I have is that the people who are the least happy are usually the ones that have some of the best so there's, objective outcomes. There's good psychology to all That's this stuff. That's what's so crazy Meaning, to me. A negative, you know, they've done studies where physicians will read reviews and then they'll measure like, you know, certain neurotransmitters for positive feelings and negative feelings. You could have a review where you literally like, I, I, like, I don't want to say cure cancer, but like you've changed someone's whole life yeah. and that like everything in their life is better. Literally yeah. everything from eating, drinking, going to the bathroom, like breathing, their yeah. job, like everything. And it'll have like a one out of 10 measurement. Like your brain will like barely register it. Right. right okay. Right. Barely register kind of it. You've literally that one. improved, yeah. changed the whole dynamic of someone's whole existence. It's like your brain, it doesn't even matter. It's like mm. you watching some a, a taxi drive by you on the street. Right. Someone will write a negative review. It's like 
20 out of 10. Yeah, yeah. The negative emotions. World is over. <laughs> your whole, every neuron in your brain is yeah. firing and just dumping neurotransmitters over. Yeah. So it's like, it's chemical because right. it's insane that if you, for every thousand patients you have, yeah. so you have 995 that think you're God and five out of a thousand think you're Satan. And that you would Satan. fixate on that small number. You can't even, I know, you don't even it's... know that there's 995. You're just like, there's five people out there. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. like, if I told you I could give you a business, any business, where th for every thousand customers, 990 are gonna love you and pay full freight, and 10 out of nine out of a thousand are gonna hate you and want their money back, you'd be like, this is the greatest right, business right, right. in exactly. the world. It's never been done before. Yeah. So you're doing it all right. That's true. You just gotta change like the lens which you see things. Yeah. Yeah, that's I think that's a that's a great point. And and I, I you know, I want to believe that I've gotten better. And I only know this stuff because I've but... been, you know, dragged through the mud. Well, we, up, we, we've torn up, all, spit we've out. all been that yeah. uh, through that. Um, I think you, I learn. Think you learn, you learn yeah. or you lose like there's right. Right. Yeah. You get through it um, for sure. And if, by the way, if someone's going to hate you, they're yeah. going to hate you. Like you're probably not going to be able to rescue that. Right. So like I like to think of it as like a relate. like, you know, you're going to break up with someone like you don't need to drag it out for six months. Like just yeah. break up, yeah. <laughs> get it over with. The quicker, the better. Yeah. I like to watch Colin and Samir on YouTube. Do you know who these guys no. are? So they have a YouTube channel that's like four other content creators. And they talk about, you know, people building businesses around their content and their channels and, and other whatever side hustles that people might have and, and how to just grow, continue to grow on YouTube and, and whatever and beyond. And um, one question that they frequently ask their guests is like what their relationship is with money. Like, and that could be kind of their their origin, where they grew up, how, you know, how they were raised. Um, but I think it's, it's relevant, you know, for the type of work that we do and, and the specific type of practice that, that we have. So, you know, just because you count it doesn't mean it's a scoreboard, right? Meaning if you're always thinking about how much money, you know, you're making, it's a, that's a bad way to go through your life. You know, there's always someone who's going to make Someone's more. Someone's going to make more, yeah. So, you know, in the office, I say, like, I say the grass is greener where you water it. So what's mm -hmm. important to you? If it's like your family and your ability to travel with your family because that's when you get a time to connect, then like you should try to earn as much money as you can to like do that. When it comes to the business and finances in terms mm -hmm. of pricing, the way I look at any business is, or any product, any service, the price is what you pay, but the value is what you get. Mm -hmm. As long as the perceived value is higher than the price, there is no limit to the price. And what I mean by that is like for us, obviously mm -hmm. like we offer a lot more before, during and after surgery. It is hospitality, it is, um, you know, setting the table, the book, if you've ever, if you haven't read it, I, mm -hmm. I highly suggest it. It's that coming to life in medicine. You know, it's the doctors visiting you every day, 24 hour care from the nurses, the right. swag, someone who like, has dedicated their whole life to this one procedure. Like we make this such a big deal. It's proactive, it's not reactive. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, even though someone like me may be like 8X for the same procedure mm -hmm. as like the person down the street, you know, the patients will tell you, I, oh, I think the value is 100X. Yeah. I think the key thing for someone when they're in their business to remember is price is what they pay, value is what you get if your value that you're providing mm -hmm. in your product service and experience is higher than the price the price doesn't matter and if it's below you got problems yeah yeah a lot and of you need to always mm -hmm. listen there's only two ways to increase the, your business the number of customers yeah or the value per customer so we're not trying to operate on everyone but we mm -hmm. want the people who choose us to get the best value that's ever been possible in plastic surgery yeah many patients who reach out you know who usually don't end up being patients here but you know they, they at least call in and they wonder like why isn't the price like it is in turkey you know and it's like well it, we, we work very differently you know well, if you want me to do this, one surgery if the prices a day, were the same who would you pick right and then you say you and say yeah. why they say oh you have the experience it's safer you're yeah. close to home your results are nicer <laughs> correct so if it's safer and yeah. you have more experience you're close to home you have a bigger staff and you have better facilities you know does any of that have any value right. if the answer is yeah. no well you know god god bless yeah um 
you know, the other thing is if someone calls you and says, hey, uh, this other doctor is a third of you. Yeah, they probably should be. That's probably about right. <laughs> That's right. probably about the right price. They're priced for that. appropriately. Yeah, that, that sounds. Yeah. It sounds like they're priced super appropriately. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, like if, yeah. if like if there's a, a plastic, sur you know, I want to say plastic. Whoever who dabbles in hair really has no clue. Yeah, no. and they're gonna, most plastic surgeons. Correct. Who, no you know, clue. Do right? other things. I don't yeah. even. I've had the procedure twice. Yeah. I have no idea yeah. about any of it. I right. just chose great surgeons. Showed up. Did the thing. Yeah did whatever they told me after. Yeah. But like if they're charging, you know, one fifth of you, one tenth, that's probably the right price for them. Yeah. And that's telling you something uh, when you're a consumer, a patient, and you're trying to make a decision, you know? Medicine is very difficult for people. There's this uniform trust in physicians, mm -hmm. um, yet in every other service and product they buy, they understand, you know, it's, it's hard to convey value knowledge. You know, if they they understand that um, a Kia is cheaper than a Ferrari, they just like no one goes to Ferrari mm -hmm. and say, "Well, the Kia is only like four grand. Right. Why right. why is this car four hundred and eighty? Yeah, they just like, sort of it just, know. It's like they, they get it, right? Like yeah. there's a <laughs> like that's I, I bet you that's never happened. Right. No one goes to Carbone, my favorite restaurant, Tries and to say the chicken them. parm down the street's twelve bucks. Why right. is it sixty eight bucks here? Yeah. I want to pay twelve bucks. Right. But medicine is somehow different. So right. you have to show, and that's why social is the greatest thing because yeah. it is word of mouth times the world. It's the world word of mouth. Yeah. Um, you have to show value, and it's not right. once. You, that's why you have to show the same thing all day, every day. Make, like make no mistake people like you should your instagram is the same every day i'm like damn right it is yeah because we're doing it each and every day there is no doubt we are the authority right that's this what is, we do this is the yeah. e this is the peace of mind yeah. this is we know you want what we do every day I'm not yeah. doing something different tomorrow and that goes back to what we were talking about in the beginning with um, expertise. You know, if you really want to be like a master level expert in a specific type of procedure, you need to be doing it all the time. It's fun. And going you can't in the do everything room. all the time. You can't well, do everything. I all love time. going in the operating room because I'm like walking in like I'm going to rock this procedure. Like I know everything I could you know. Like I think I know as much as I know. Yeah. I do know that as the island of knowledge grows, so does the shore of ignorance. We're always <laughs> learning new mistakes to yeah. make. But, um, you know, it's fun to know the nooks, the crannies, the nuances. You can see problems coming a little faster than other people. Yeah. Yeah. And there are always potentials for, for complications, even in the best of hands. But you reduce, you reduce that risk going with someone who does it all the time and has less likely seen to it happen, play out. happen. And when it does happen, it's going to be spotted earlier, dealt with quicker and have right. less mitigating issues. Right. And that's why, you know, I remind people sometimes when they're really nervous post-operatively, you know, with swelling or whatever, redness, I just, you know, and you can tell the patient who's just like nervous, which is, you know, most of the people who express nerve uh, or, or, you know, that kind of um, attitude. But then you've got some people where the behavior is starting to turn a little bit accusational. I don't know if you, you know what I mean? And you can kind of, you can hear it so in one, their voice and the tone of their emails. One of the emails. things in my consults I tell and everyone. And I'm like, trust me, you trusted me for your that, surgery. Trust me for your recovery. I don't know where I heard this, but, or maybe I made it up. And, and we all say it. I tell people, you are gonna hate me for three weeks and then love me for the rest of your life. But I say for three weeks, you are gonna hate my guts and you're gonna wish you never did it and you're gonna question why you did it and you're gonna have a mental meltdown. Yeah, well, that's realistic expectations. And I, I tell guess. them uh, that if you yeah. don't have that, you're yeah. crazy because right. I'm taking, you know, I do big body surgery. We're, I'm taking your whole body apart. Yeah. You're going to look worse. You're going to look like someone cut you in half and you're going to look insane for three weeks. You'll be bent over with tubes coming out at every, at, at every hole. You're yeah. going to be wearing a diaper. Plastic surgery is not glamorous at the beginning. It's glamorous right. later. Yeah. Yeah, that's and, true. But then they, you know, for three, they literally, if when I tell them that, we can joke about it. You know, they'll text me, oh, do I really hate you today? Do I really regret doing this today? Because I told them all that that was part of the normal experience. Yeah. And I've written a lot of blogs on the psychology of healing and how hard it is, even when there's no problems. And I've known that, you know, having, you know, surgery myself, um, it's not an easy process. It's a psychological, yeah. I don't know if I'd say trauma, but it's a burden. It's a psychological mm -hmm. and emotional burden, even in the most well, um, you know, adjusted people. Yeah. And these are some unknowns and you, you wonder if you've made the right decision, you know? Well, we um, have 24 hour care and I see my patients every day that they're in town or around because yeah. 
just because something like it's normal to me, but it's insanely abnormal to that. Like they've never even seen it right. and it's their body and it looks crazy. Yeah. So yeah. most of the time you're seeing someone, it's like, that's normal. That's normal. That's normal. That's normal. That's normal. And they're like, interesting because that there's doesn't a range. look normal. <laughs> there, yeah. There, there, there's a In range my, of what normal looks like. I don't think breasts like, should yeah. look like that. I don't think yeah. bums should look like that. And you're like, trust me. Yeah, it gets better. It gets better. But you got to be there in person, yeah. hammering at home. And then they got to really trust you and be like, I right. have, you have to be able to look them in the eye and say, I've done this 8,000 times. I promise you, I'm not going to let you down. Yeah, yeah, totally. What would you say is like the most rewarding part of the job? You know, two things. We get to be, you know, people get to make one decision that changes mm -hmm. their life forever. Mostly for good, some people for bad. But, you know, that's important. That's to me, that brings a lot of joy in my life because for a lot of people, that one interaction with me changed their whole life. And then the second is watching my staff grow mm -hmm. and that not just grow in like terms individually, of size. Yeah. Each person. Because, yeah. you know, we have the book club. We I stimulate a lot of growth. You know, I want them to grow mm -hmm. individually so much that I'll never be able to afford them and they're going to go on and do great things elsewhere. And I'll have to continuously hire yeah. because, you know, it's like your children. It's like, you, you know, you get a lot of these people young and raw and you like watch them grow. You're yeah. like find new roles for them, some ways for them to advance if they want they that. They need a lot of people look, you know, as you as the leader, as like, you know, to nurture, you know, someone may come to you who's never done advertising and just be mm -hmm. like, all of a sudden, you know, they get into it and you say, okay, read these books, listen to this podcast, yeah. now do this, do this, do this, do this. And all of a sudden they're like off to the races. And they might outgrow your practice yeah, or my practice. I don't practice. get worried about that. It's, I tell yeah, people like if, you're, like, if you're doing this for 10, if you haven't changed in 10 years, like we got problems. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because yeah. that means we have, you know, we, we kept you around too long. Yeah, listen, we, we like to grow and advance. And I think we like to see that um, in the people around us as well, so. Cool. Yeah. Listen, Teddy Roosevelt said, yeah. you can, you can, um, what do you say? You can rot out or you can rust out. And like, we choose to rust out, meaning we're going to do stuff with our life. We're not just going to yeah. rot. Yeah. We don't sit around. Exactly. <laughs> That's for sure. Ryan, thanks so much for being here. Absolute pleasure. pleasure Thank man. you. Thanks.